Tonight's top EU stories from the unit website include an EU vote? Ridiculous. European Central Bank official says Euro needs central banking oversight along the lines of the United States. Europeans slide towards poverty and radicalisation. And bicycles are outselling cars in Europe, and that might not just be a blip. Plus, Linux and GCHQ. I'm Rick Timmis, and this is the Unit Nightly News. First, from a homepage. Sir Richard Branson has described plans for a referendum on whether Britain should be a member of the European Union ridiculous and that leaving the economic bloc would badly damage UK businesses. In a wide-ranging interview with the Sunday Telegraph, the entrepreneur and founder of Virgin Atlantic, who says he now spends 90% of his time working for philanthropic causes, also defended himself against suggestions that he had left the country for tax reasons. My income from speeches is about six to eight million pounds, and 100% of which I give to charity. So whether I lived in Britain or elsewhere, it would be tax-free anyway, Sir Richard said. Well, I'm shocked. Do people really pay him that much to talk drivel? Look, if you own a multinational corporation, then arguing in favour of the EU will always be the case. For the same reason I explained in yesterday's nightly news. The EU Commission is 28 appointed people. That makes it a very easy target to subvert. Now I will be covering the idea of subverting systems in more detail later in the show. Richard, you come across as a lovely bloke, but when it comes to governance of peoples and countries, anything other than a fully transparent democracy is simply just not cricket. A top European Central Bank official says the Euro Currency Union needs US-style centralised banking oversight so that individual countries don't have to deal with busted banks alone. Jörg Asmussen said Friday in the text of a speech in Milan that during the crisis in the US it was federal institutions that stepped into the breach. Asmussen, who sits on the ECB's six-member executive board, cited the role of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which has overseen the sale of restructuring of hundreds of unviable banks. He also pointed to support from the US Treasury Department for banks to raise capital through the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP. No single US state, he said, could have dealt with such a burden. That's a very interesting perspective from our budding Euro Bureau kleptocrat. Interesting, but incorrect. In the US and Europe, the people have been saddled with the debts generated by reckless banking, manipulation of the legislation that protected people from rogue bank gambling, and that is what it is. I'm talking about Glass-Steagall and banking deregulation. Yep, that's right, it's you, Gordon Brown, that I'm looking at, and you can wipe that daft grin off your face as well, Tony. Only one country has taken the correct course of action, which is to default on the banker's debt and throw them in jail. That country is Iceland. It was the first to fail, but its economy now gets stronger by the day. It has solid trade agreements with China and has thrown mud in the eyes of the EU kleptocrats by leaving the EU a session table with the parting words, We're not coming back. As the socio-economic crisis tightens its grip on Europe, the number of Europeans living beyond the poverty line rapidly increases and is now well over 84 million, according to the official statistics. 26 million people in the European Union are out of a job. The figure doesn't include illegal immigrants. A study conducted by the Oxfam charity organisation shows that 10% of the wealthiest EU citizens own 24% of the EU wealth while 10% of the poorest Europeans own just 3%. The widening gap between the rich and the poor is fraught with unrest and rag- radicalisation in European societies. Now, I was asked about this very question earlier this month at Exeter University Debating Society, one of our speaking events. 
Labour and Conservatives were vocalising scotch mist about their optimism for an economic recovery. And as this article shows, we're in one hell of a mess. These elements have unfolded just as Dr Eric Edmund, our economic advisor here at the unit, predicted. So, what comes next? Well, in Eric's interview, which you can find in the audio library on our website, of almost two years ago, he said the government would print money, and lots of money, and that would cause hyperinflation. Well, I can't say I have figured out how that mechanism works, but let's look at what the new Bank of England governor, Mark Carnage, sorry, that should be Carney. Ah, hey-ho. Let it stick with, let's stick with Carnage, just for kicks. So... Mark Carnage has said he will more than double the Bank of England asset holding from £4 trillion to £9 trillion as required. So, Mr Carnage, our non-British Bank of England governor, whilst the seat on his leather armchair is still cold, has told the bond markets, I'm prepared to sell out the UK to the tune of £5 trillion. And the bond markets are loving it. But... If Eric Edmund is right, and I haven't heard a bum steer from him in all the years that I've known him, then we, my friends, are staring at hyperinflation through a carpet bag. Bicycle sales outpaced new car sales last year in all of the 27 member countries of the European Union, except Belgium and Luxembourg. One reason is that Car sales have slumped in the midst of the Eurozone crisis. But there are signs that this slump isn't temporary. It's a reflection, perhaps, of a larger change in how people are travelling. Ha! <laughs> You're not kidding. I had a great experience recently. I got flashed by a speed camera. Not excessive speed, but enough to cop me a choice of fine and points or go on a speed safety awareness course. Well, having been shown the error of my ways and briefed that almost everywhere in urbanised Britain the speed limit is 30 miles an hour and in residential settings it's often 20 miles an hour, I've turned over a new leaf. For the last month I have stuck rigidly to the speed limit, firmly reassured that I am doing my best to keep the roads safe for everybody. The downside is that if you get behind me in your morning hurry to the office, I'm going to thoroughly ruin your day. You'll be so frustrated that you'll want to chuck your car in and buy a bicycle. In fact, the other day I was undertaken by a man on a bicycle dressed in lime, lime green lycra. That's not a good look, folks. However, since my rehabilitation, I have had very few traffic problems. The road is usually clear in front of me. So I say, let's hear it for the EU road transport safety harmonisation policies. And remember, folks, don't get stressed. Buy a bike. You'll get there quicker. Germany has banned the use of Windows 8 because the TPM module provides a remote access backdoor to the NSA. And GCHQ is now in the frame for its involvement in the Snowden government spying debacle. Now I want to link the concepts in this article to Story 1, Richard Branson and the EU Unelected Commission. Now firstly, it's on record that the NSA have hacked access into Microsoft, Apple and Google. The only computer operating systems that appear to be unaffected by this global NSA GCHQ government surveillance racket are the free software ones, also known as open source systems. But why? Well, this article takes you through the details, but here are the key points. Even the hardened open source Linux operating system has had attempts by government to subvert its computer code with a backdoor. Now, we don't know how Linux founder Linus Torvalds reacted to the request, but even if he wanted to, he couldn't get away with introducing a backdoor into Linux, unless the NSA were in a position to persuade and buy off the whole international kernel development team. And that's the beauty of open development model of free software. Now, this development model operates in an even more open and transparent way than that of a parliamentary democracy. It's a real democratic meritocracy, and it has been a huge success. The free software community is truly global. It transcends borders, language and time zones. It is responsible for the creation of the internet, Android phones, smart TVs, smart energy meters, TiVo and the list goes on. Sitting silently, ticking safely and securely away behind these gadgets are free software systems such as GNU Linux. 
Now, if you want to be secure on your computer, protect yourself from prying eyes, ensuring your personal and private information like photos, banking and identity are kept safe, secure and out of the NSA and GCHQ's reach, then you need a computer running the Linux operating system. Today in our video library, now Andrew Fear, our awesome webmaster, had a request from one of our newsletter readers, whose Windows computer decided to lose all the copies of the Unit Daily Digest. Nice. Well, relax folks, we've decided to create a new space on our website in the newsletters section for all the back issues of the Digest, and Andrew is busy adding these to the site. All our digests are fully searchable via the search box on our website too, and we hope that you find this new feature useful. Well, so today's video, supporting our article about government hacking, I talked a little about the Linux computer operating system as a secure, safe and reliable alternative to using Windows. Even more of a bonus, it's free. But don't take my word for it. Here's a net buddy of mine, Nixie Pixel, to tell you more about it. I'm Nixie Pixel, and you're watching the first ever episode of my new show, OS Alt. I will be your tour guide on our journey through the good, bad, and ugly of open source. Today we look at alternatives to the ever popular Microsoft Windows operating system. Since the 80s, Windows have been booting up desktops, increasing productivity, powering games, helping businesses run, and creating untold numbers of crashes as well as uh, <coughs> raping our wallets. We are using Linux daily to up our productivity, so up yours. The most recent stable version is Windows 7. We like it because it enables us to run all of our software that we need for our tasks, be they for business, personal use, or gaming. Desktop software development is focused on Microsoft Windows platform, and everything else is a distant second. It has a huge mature development team of hundreds and millions of users. If you have a Windows issue, you can all but guarantee that someone somewhere has already seen it and solved it, hopefully. We don't like Windows 7 so much is because it costs buku bucks and each piece of software that runs on it also likely costs money. And not to mention that Microsoft runs validation checks on you on a constant basis. Not really too happy about that. It tends to be unstable and insecure because you have thousands of different viruses, lots of prawn with lots of viruses, and um, yeah, we'll just don't even have to talk about the blue screens of death. Chances are if you've ever had used Windows and had problems like this, it would cause you to sob while recoiling in the fetal position. And boy is it a resource hog, it takes up tons of space and the software written for Windows brings more of the same. These days 6 gigs of RAM and terabytes of hard drive space can be gobbled up quickly. Not to mention, without major tweaks to the OS, you can't really customize Windows to at least my liking that well. Our choices are pretty limited. My favorite open source alternative for those looking to switch from Microsoft Windows is a Linux distro called Linux Mint. This free OS is based on Ubuntu, which I adore door, and it comes bundled with enough software to satisfy most users' needs right out of the box, or off the CD. And believe me, Mint is fast. Its resource usage is far less than Windows, and it takes up far less space on your hard drive. Now, it may be a little tough for some users to install in Windows, but once you have installed it, it's far more stable, and you'll never have to be worried about trolling your prawn again. No viruses. You don't have a multi-billion dollar corporation supporting you if things go wrong, but Linux Mint and Ubuntu communities are ginormous with teams created just to help new users with the problems they face starting out on a new operating system. And those can be rather vast. People always think of Linux operating systems as requiring use of the command line, but you don't have to type commands in if you don't have any desire to. Many users just do because some things are quicker to do this way. Software is incredibly easy to install in Linux Mint. Go to the software manager, pick what you want, and it will download and install for you. With a click of a single button, you can update all of the software you've installed, including the operating system itself. Now most programs that run on Mint share resources, so their installation sizes are super small, saving all that precious hard drive space for your data. 
While I think Mint looks great when you first install it, the options for customization go way beyond what you can do with Windows, if you desire to change it, of course. The real negatives to switching to a Linux-based OS are the lack of specialized software and current games. Because Linux holds so little of the desktop market share, around 1% to 2%, few software developers write programs to run on it. Um, so where Linux Mint is behind is the access to high-end applications such as multimedia productions, computer-aided design, and of course the latest games, sad face. In many cases, open source alternatives exist to do some of the same things, but they can be very lacking in terms of features and maturity. Overall, I give Mint a four to five stars as an alternative for Windows. For the majority of casual computer users who just want to do the run-of-the-mill stuff like surf the web, watch videos, check email, and play some web-based games, using social media, Linux Mint is perfect for that. What prevents me from switching over completely is the lack of support for the latest games and specialized software, such as video editing. If you want to try it but are worried about giving up Windows, do what I do. Install Mint side by side with Windows, giving you an option at boot on what you want to use. The latest version of Linux Mint is 12, codenamed Lisa, and you can download it for free here. Now, I have included a link below to the Linux Mint website where you can download the software for free. Or write to us here at the unit with your name and address and we'll mail you an install CD free of charge. Links to our contact page are below. I'm Rick Timmis, reporting for the unit, Nightly News. I'll see you soon.